Amen. I have the privilege once again of being able to preach to you here tonight from the Word of the Lord, and I am so thankful for this opportunity. Uh, just for a few moments here tonight, I'm going to be speaking on this topic, He Sees You. He Sees You. Turn to your neighbor and say, He Sees You. Amen. Why don't we pray one more time, ask God to have His way with the rest of the service. Amen. We are so thankful, Lord, for your presence that have met us in this place. God, we are so thankful for everything that you've already accomplished in your presence. God, and we pray right now that you would allow the power of the Holy Ghost to rest in this place. You just continue, Lord, to move in our hearts. God, I pray, Jesus, that you would take every stony heart and turn it to flesh. God, that you would open up our eyes to your word, Jesus, that you would allow your word to be planted into our hearts here tonight. In Jesus' name, we give you all the praise and all the glory. Everybody said amen. 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 You may be seated. A quick little story that I read uh, the other day is about uh, a company that has initiated a plan to, to put in a new, uh, a new benefit plan. And in order to actually have it work, everybody had to sign up for it. They needed 100% participation and everybody signed up except for one individual named Sam this isn't Sam Watson and Sam uh, after everybody signed up they couldn't convince him to sign up so finally the company president invited him into his office and said we're gonna have a little chat and he said Sam here's the deal here's a copy of the new plan that we have and here's a pen if you don't sign it you're fired and quickly, Sam grabs that pen, and he begins to sign. And the company president, he asks Sam, Sam, why, why did it take you this long to sign the papers? Why didn't you sign it earlier? And Sam replied, he said, well, nobody explained it to me quite so clearly before. <laughs> People are motivated by different things today. We are motivated to get out of bed for various things, including coffee. We are motivated by prizes by awards, by accomplishments, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. If you have your Bibles here tonight, and I know, Carl, you do, we can open up to John chapter 6. And I'd like for us to take a look at a moment recorded for us in Scripture where Jesus was motivated to go to supernatural lengths to save his disciples. Here in John chapter 6, sandwiched between the story of the miracle feeding of the 5,000 and the Lord's sermon about being the bread of life is this short story of Jesus walking on the water. Coincidence? I think not. Between God supplying the temporal and very human need of the hungry and proclaiming that he is the one who gives, not only gives life, but sustains and keeps life, he rescues his disciples from shipwreck and certain death. He kept them. He sustained them. He is exactly what they needed. But what is it that motivated Christ to go to the supernatural lengths that he did to save 12 men from disaster and certain death? I'll give you a little bit of backstory so this all makes sense. Jesus wanted to get away because he was grieving the loss of his friend, John the Baptist. So he goes to the other side of the lake. And before he knows it, the crowd follows them. So rather than ignore them, he ministers because he sees them as sheep without a shepherd. The Bible says that he has compassion for them. He does what he does naturally. He heals the sick. He casts out demons. He teaches them. He encourages them. And all of a sudden, there are bellies that start growling. The crowd grows and the disciples get concerned and Jesus he turns to Philip and says where will we buy food for these people to eat and Philip he replies eight months wages would not be enough to purchase enough food for all these people to eat his disciples they search the crowd and they find a young boy who has a little lunch five loaves two fish but how far will that go amongst all these people and Jesus basically says let me show you so he takes the bread and gives thanks. And before they know it, Christ has taken this little bit of food and multiplied it over and over and over again. He has his disciples distribute the, fruit, the food from the crowd. 
And there was so much food that there ends up being 12 baskets left over. How many love that leftovers? Praise the Lord. You put them in the containers, you put them in your fridge, and then two weeks later you decide to throw it out. The people were so impressed by that that they wanted to take the Lord by force to make him king. Now, I, I want to give a little side note here. I was telling them during team meeting as we were discussing this week's agenda and what would take place and that I was going to be speaking here tonight. It dawned on me that the next preacher you would hear after me is going to be Dr. Bernard. And so I'm just going to let him clean up any mess I create here tonight. The people, they were so impressed by the Lord. They were so amazed at the miracles that he had performed and the miracle that he had provided to them, the food that he had given them, that they wanted to take him by force and make him their king. They wanted to overthrow their political system and interject Christ as king. So that is where we pick up the story. John chapter 6, verse 14, John's gospel, he gives the impression that Jesus went off to a mountain and the disciples hop in a boat and go to the other side of the lake. Simple as that. But as we read this story, we find the disciples uh, did not voluntarily get into the boat. Jesus had to make them get into the boat. We see this in the gospel of Matthew and Mark. Mark chapter 6, verse 45, it says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida. Well, he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. And so this verse, it gives the idea that maybe the disciples did not want to get into the boat, and we ask why. Why would the disciples not want to get into the boat? Maybe they were worried for Jesus, or maybe they were worried for themselves. Maybe they could see that a storm was brewing, and they didn't want to be on a boat, especially without him. Whatever the reason, the point is that the Lord was up on a mountain and the disciples were alone on the boat on the Sea of Galilee. The fact is, is that when they went out on the boat after a few hours, a storm came up. We read from the story in John. He writes, John chapter 6, verse 17, he says, By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, the waters grew rough. The Sea of Galilee, just because of its location and how it was engulfed by mountainsides on either pass, the winds would come through the mountains and valleys and hit that body of water and a storm would come up from nowhere. So the disciples, they found themselves on a sea in a storm. And not only were they on a sea in a storm, but they were in the middle of that sea, the Bible tells us. They were the furthest point from any shore. In Mark chapter 6, he tells us when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on land. And now about this time, the disciples may have been having a little bit of a flashback. If you have uh, looked at the Gospels prior to this, Matthew chapter 8 it records another storm that the disciples had earlier found themselves in. It says in Matthew chapter 8, Then he got into the boat, and it is, his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. Can you imagine that, sleeping during the storm? The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. And so this current experience probably brought a little bit of a flashback to them. The difference this time was that Jesus was not on their boat. He was on a mountain praying. All they knew was that the Lord was not where they wanted him to be. Where is Jesus when we need him? But the Gospel of Mark seems to imply that just because he is absent physically, he is not absent spiritually. Mark, he goes on to say in verse 48, he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he went to them walking on the water. Jesus saw the disciples straining at the oars. Let me tell you tonight that God sees us even when we don't think he does. 
the fourth watch of the night in nautical terms is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. It's dark. The Lord probably didn't have his binoculars with him. He probably didn't have night vision goggles. But that night, despite the storm raging and the sky dark, he seen them. He seen them struggling. He seen them wrestling to stay afloat. They were probably mentally and physically exhausted, and here comes Jesus. He comes to them in a way which they had never experienced him before. He comes to them walking on the water. The very thing that they were struggling against, he is walking on top of. And John, he says in his gospel, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. They had never experienced the Lord do what he was doing now, and they couldn't believe their eyes. They had seen him use water when he turned water into wine. They had heard about when he sat at the well with the Sumerian woman and offered her living water. They had seen him at the water pool of Bethesda and healed the lame man, but this was something entirely new. And so it is easy to ask, why walk on water? Why not just show up on a boat? With a little background reading, we learn that water has a lot of symbolism in the Bible. Water sometimes was seen as a good thing, but it was also seen as a bad thing. A thing that represented chaos and evil. An abyss, a watery grave, a picture of hell. And especially in the Old Testament, water often represented the thing that stood between the people of God and their deliverance. If you think back on the story of Moses, God was in the process of delivering his people out of captivity, and the people faced the Red Sea. The enemy on their back, see in front of them, the largest obstacle that they had faced yet. They were facing the thing that stood between them and their deliverance, and God allowed Moses to part that water, and they were able to go to freedom. And now we see Jesus as the new Moses exercising his dominance over the thing that would separate God's people from him. The thing that would seek to destroy them. The apostles were afraid and Christ looks at them and says, it is I, don't be afraid. And about that time is when we get a new detail in this story where Matthew informs us that Peter decided in the middle of the storm that he wanted to learn how to walk on water himself. So Jesus says, it is I, don't be afraid. Peter says, prove it. No, it says that, seriously. Lord, if it's you. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Prove that it's you. Peter was impulsive. He was one of those individuals that you can imagine the words came out before the thought could formulate whether or not it was filtered. Just, blah. It's not hard to tell that about his conversation here. And so Jesus, he calls Peter out. He says, come. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat. Matthew chapter 14, verse 29. Walked on the water and came toward Jesus. Peter got out of the boat. We don't know how many steps he took. One, two, three. We have no idea. We don't know. But we do know that he had enough faith to begin that journey towards Jesus in the middle of that storm. But then he messes up. He takes his eyes off of Jesus, and he begins to sink. And the Scripture tells us in Matthew chapter 14, verse 30, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? Jesus reaches down, catches him, looks him in the eyes and says, you have little faith, why did you doubt? Peter, when are you going to get this? When are you going to understand that I can deliver you from any storm if you just keep your eyes on me? John, he goes on to say, then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. We can read this without realizing that this is another miracle. They bring Jesus into the boat, and just like that, immediately, they're transported safely to the shore, safe on solid footing. I imagine that 
The disciples by now were talking about the event as they reached solid footing, as they reached the shore. Can you believe what we just went through? We're straining at the oars in the storm. Jesus comes walking on the water, and then crazy Peter decides to go to him in the middle of the storm, and he sinks like a ton of bricks. But Jesus reaches down and picks him up. It's amazing. This story, it sounds like one that they would have heard since childhood, one written by King David in the book of Psalms. When King David was fearful of being consumed by his enemies, God reached down and delivered him, and he records his testimony in the form of a song to the Lord in Psalm 18. This is what he says. He reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy. From my foes who were too strong for me. They confronted me in the day of my disaster, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. This is King David. He had been hunted for years from the current king. He knew what it was like to be surrounded by enemies in disaster and battle. But in spite of everything he encountered, he testified that God reached down to the deepest part of my despair, and he pulled me out. In our own Christian life, we call those storms trials, tribulations. And whether we like it or not, those storms come. Sometimes those storms are because of our own choices in life. Every one of us have made choices that have likely brought consequences into our lives. But sometimes storms come not because of something that we did, but because simply due to the fact that we live in a fallen, broken world full of sin. But for the Christian, those storms are not without purpose. In fact, in James chapter 1, the writer tells us that those storms serve to strengthen our faith. And that we should actually be joyful when they come because they serve to mature us. James, he writes, James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4, says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If you have been... In the church, for any length of time, you should know that storms are expected and they come as opportunities to test our faith. We don't like it, but it's true. And sometimes they come on us suddenly, without warning. One day, we are standing on the beach with Jesus, eating fish and chips as the Lord provides and the sun is shining. Praising the Lord. The next minute, we find ourselves forced out into the middle of the sea in a storm, and the Lord is nowhere to be found. We get the phone call in the middle of the night that we're not expecting. The doctor says, I have some bad news for you. You are thrown a curveball in your own home. The storms come. Yesterday was fine, and then whoosh, it comes through like a train, and you respond in panic. Where is the Lord? I just felt him in church last Sunday. Where is the Lord? He isn't in my boat. Doesn't he care about my my finances, my relationship, my health, my child? And then we are reminded of what Mark says. He saw them. He saw them. Despite all improbabilities, he sees you. You may have been weathering your storm for a while now. You were in the fourth watch of the night. The time when you were feeling the most physically, emotionally, and spiritually weak, and you just want to throw in the towel, but he sees you. He sees you, and he will come in the most unexpected ways. I've said this before, but I'll say it again. I don't believe that the Lord creates every storm, but I know that he knows how to properly utilize every storm. He wants our faith to grow. He wants you to walk on what is troubling you. But he's the only one that can teach you how to walk on stormy seas. You can't walk into chapters and find a book called Water Walking for Dummies. It's not there. I've looked. The Lord calls us out by one word. Come. Come. An invitation to join Him in His power to overcome. 
You have authority by the power of the Holy Ghost that is in you tonight over this storm in your life that is attempting to isolate you from your relationship with God. And you say, what does that look like? What does it look like to walk on water today? Let me tell you that you are walking on water when you realize that the storm is not going to control you or define you. You are a child of the living God made in His image, new creations in Christ. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen? Amen. Hallelujah. He has placed His Spirit inside of you so that you would never be alone, but that you would always have the comfort of Him being with you. That is your identity. That's who you are at your core. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church, and neither will your storm. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He's keeping his eyes on you. Now, you may be thinking, well, that's cool. That's nice, Pastor Mark. You have given me a nice spiritual happy thought that I can think about for the day, and I need to see some practical examples. We have the promise from the Word of God. The prophet Isaiah, he pins the words underneath the unction of the Holy Ghost. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. There is an ancient map that is on display today at the British Museum in London. You may have heard of it before, before the map made its way to the British Museum. It was the prized possession of a British explorer by the name of Sir John Franklin in the 1800s. In spite of its value, Sir John Franklin was offended by the fear that the ancient mariners had, and so he scratched out the inscriptions. And in place of the phrases that once read, here be giants, here be fiery scorpions, here be dragons, he wrote these words across the map, here is God. There is no place you can go. There is no storm you can encounter that God is not. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If I could have the music come back at this time. He sees you. He's with you. Actually, Pastor mentioned this morning, God with us. In every circumstance of life tonight, He is calling us out. Consider the map of your own life. Areas that you have deemed to not be safe. To have monsters. What monsters can you write those words, here is God, over? You've seen what God can do. You know He is able. He's never left you before, so He won't abandon you now. He has made it His mission to set His eyes on you and rescue you. I'm here to remind somebody tonight that God sees you. Come on, somebody. God sees you. Hallelujah. You're not alone. Praise your name. If we could stand together. Peter, he might have went overboard with his faith. Excuse the pun. And when he got back into the boat, dripping wet from the waves that he was engulfed by, his new experience, he was changed. In fact, all of the disciples were. Because the Bible tells us that they began worshiping Christ, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. We have a new revelation of who you are, Lord. You're not the God of some distant land. You're not the God of some place afar off. But you're the God of the here and now. You're the God that sees us. What we have to learn tonight is that any problem that's over my head is already under his feet. You may not fear drowning in water. You may fear poor health. It's under his feet. You may fear financial loss. It's under his feet. You may fear the instability of our world. Let me tell you tonight, it's under his feet. I don't care what the media says. It's under his feet. He has all power. He has all authority. Whatever threatens to be over your head is already under his feet. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, 
God raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above. All rule and authority, power and dominion, and God placed all things under his feet. You say, oh, that's nice, but I'm down here in the middle of this mess. Actually, spiritually speaking, we share the same perspective that Jesus does. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So where am I right now? From, from this advantage, from this perspective, physically, I'm standing on the platform at Mission Point. That would be correct. But spiritually, we are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. And Paul used the phrase in Christ over 70 times. Christ in me speaks of power, but me in Christ speaks of position. I can either look at my problems from this perspective and they look big and scary. Or I can look at my problems from his perspective. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Hallelujah, Jesus. You have the same choice. Jesus has three words for us today. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Yes, it's a scary world, but he who watches over you neither slumbers nor sleeps. He loves you and has told us tonight to not be afraid. Whatever threatens to be over your head is already under his feet. Your perspective determines the size of your problem. When you recognize that you were in Christ, you were able to see your problems from his perspective. Jesus says in John chapter 16, verse 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble. We know that, but take heart. I have overcome the world. How many thankful to know the overcomer here tonight? Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You may not understand what you're going through, but all you really need to know is that he's with you. And as I open up this altar tonight, I want to give a little bit of guidance in what to pray. We want our prayers to connect with God. We want to touch heaven when we call it his name. If you went to the doctor and the doctor, you told the doctor that you're sick and the doctor prescribes you a medicine that will cure your sickness. You go to the pharmacy, you pick it up, you take it home and you put it on the shelf and leave it there. It would do you no good. It's not enough just to know that you have access to the cure. You have to follow the instructions. God has already given us everything that we need. We have access to him through prayer and we have direction from his word. But if we don't follow his direction from his word, it will do us no good. The Bible tells us how we find God. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 13, it says, And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. We don't find God from up here. From all of our knowledge, from all of our intellect, we find God when we come to God with all of our heart. Pouring everything out to God. So tonight, as we step out of our pews and come to the front to join together in prayer, I want us to pray together tonight with all of our heart. Pour it all out before God. Lay it out before Him and seek Him. Because the Bible says that if we seek Him with all of our heart, he will be found. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. As we begin to sing this song, would you come to this altar? We're going to begin to pray. Hallelujah, Jesus. God, we pray here right now, Jesus, that you would rescue every single one from the storm that they're in right now, Jesus. You know the way that we take, Lord. You know, Jesus, the stormy seas that we've been on. Lord, God, you know exactly where you are, be, where we are, Jesus, because you see us. Lord, you've not looked away, God. You haven't turned your face from us, Lord, but you see us. God, and I pray here today, Jesus, that you would allow the power of the Holy Ghost to rest upon each and every one of us. God, I pray, Jesus, that you would guide our way, Jesus, that you would bring us to safety. Lord, we may not understand the storm that we're in. God, we don't understand the reason for it, Lord. But all we need to know here tonight is that you're with us and you see us. 
Lord, I pray here today for each and every one. Let your will be done in our hearts and our lives, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. I'll praise you. God, I'll praise you no matter what. Hallelujah, Jesus. You're the King of kings. You're the Lord of lords. We praise your great name. 